My talk is called Everything I Have Learned, I Have Learned from Somebody Else. Uh, this talk could also have been called um, The Technology of Yesterday or Tomorrow, I mean Today, right? Um, so I feel a little bit uh, out of place having to follow up Professor Sussman and um, Joe Armstrong. I mean, these are like, uh, you know, really big people. I'm just a guy who does JavaScript in the New York Times. Um, <laughs> So I'll, I'll try my best to say something interesting to this uh, fantastic group of, of people exploring um, new approaches to um, engineering solutions to uh, the type of software problems we have today. So uh, on the flight here, I was reading this book called The Dream Machine, which was recommended recently on Alan Kay's um, mailing list, which I like to lurk on. Um, it's by uh, Waldrop, and it, and it documents the history around Licklider, who was um, pivotal in, the, um, in ARPA. He ran ARPA, and this is why we have the internet, and to a large degree why there was a lot of, of research funding put into um, the creation of programming languages and, and new kinds of computing technology, uh, and we are reaping the benefits of that today. But when you read this, you know, they, he's, they talk about Weiner, uh, sorry, Wiener, they talk about uh, von Neumann, Shannon, um, they talk about, you know, Kays in there. Um, I mean, everybody. And it's like really exciting. Like, they're right there, you know, in this is the, the, the 30s and the 40s. I mean, nobody would, would have believed that I would be sitting here up on this stage in 2013 with essentially a supercomputer, right? And so this is pretty amazing. Um, yet, yet now we have a culture which is very much um, around engineering. And, and I think it's really exciting to see that we have got to this point where we're sort of sick of the status quo and, and there's a resurgence. And not a resurgence from the academic community, but a, a resurgence among engineers, an excitement around uh, new programming language. And I think this is pretty cool. So my own story starts uh, with probably, for many of you, it also started here. I started programming on an app js using BASIC. And so, but there, something kind of stuck with me when I did this, um, which was, it was, there was a nice feedback loop. It was very fast. You type some commands. You can modify your program on the fly. And it was very, I mean, it was BASIC, but there was something about that which I think is why I I, I, I personally tend to use um, Lisp-like systems. Um, but it's also why I'm mostly interested in uh, interactive applications and UI. So my perspective is often not from like, can I build this concurrent server technology or can I build a distributed system, but how can we craft um, uh, compelling uh, interactive experiences uh, for clients? Uh, and uh, there's a funny quote by, by Dijkstra which says, Having used BASIC, I'm now mentally mutilated beyond all regeneration. Uh, <laughs> so you might have to take anything I say with a grain of salt, um, but we'll see. I'll, I'll try to redeem myself. Um, so yeah, this is the quote. OK, so uh, five years ago, I was, I've been doing JavaScript for a long time, eight years doing UI stuff. But five years ago, I started playing around with this language called Clojure. And my interest in it was, again, not from like really caring about functional programming or all this stuff. It was, oh, it runs in the JVM, and I can interact uh, with a REPL on the fly with the processing environment, which is a sort of creative coding environment that's really popular. Um, um, some, of may, some of you may have heard of processing JS, which is a JavaScript version of it. But that was actually my initial interest, was like, oh, I can actually develop these applications um, on the fly without having to go through this tedious uh, compile, fix my bugs, compile uh, cycle. But so the, the deeper I got into Clojure, I was like, oh, this is very interesting. So I was coming from uh, a lot of experience in Java and C, C++, um, JavaScript, of course, Objective-C. Um, and it was very different. When, once I started digging into Clojure, I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Clojure takes these sort of academic ideas, right? It sort of adopt, it, it takes them and modifies them and tries to make them more practical, right? So Okasaki talked about uh, purely functional data structures is very well known. Uh, in the, um, definitely in the Haskell community and OCaml and definitely in Clojure. Uh, but the thing is that Clojure actually isn't about the type of, of purely functional data structures that Okasaki described, right? Clojure's data structures are, are much more about Bagwell style data structures, which can be mutable or they can be immutable. Um, and what's cool about Bagwell's data structures is that they have very good um, complexity characteristics. In fact, so good that they're, that they're, they're basically drop-in replacements for the type of collection, mutable collections, that most programmers in mainstream languages use. And so this was kind of like an eye-opener. Wow, you took academic research, which was basically proved you could provide a, a, you know, a real solution um, that can be a drop-in replacement for mutable stuff, right? The cost is not too high. Um, and so Clojure, I think, did a lot to make 
uh, what might have seemed like an esoteric piece of technology into something practical. So uh, this sort of got me excited. I, and I started like, well, maybe I should start reading papers again. Like, I hadn't really looked at any serious computer science since I'd read SICP like uh, uh, quite some time ago. So, um, and uh, I thoroughly recommend looking at um, uh, Bagwell and Rompf did a, uh, a new version of this called RIB trees, which actually describes um, the bitmap vector try, which is actually an invention by Rich Hickey. He took the hash array map try idea and specialized it to a data structure that works more like an array. And it's, and it's actually, I think, the best introduction to how clever you can get um, with a hash array map try uh, concept. So um, I, I, I read it. So I was like getting more excited. I was like, oh, this is cool. All, this pa all these papers, there's lots of interesting things. And maybe, maybe there's stuff to find that people haven't looked at. Maybe there are other ideas like this that we can implement um, that can solve um, problems. So I, I encountered the reason schema because um, this guy, Jim Dewey, had ported this thing called Mini Cameron, which I didn't know about. Um, and I found out it was described in this book by Dan and Will, who are in attendance, and Oleg Kislyov, who's very well known in the Haskell community. And so basically what they showed by taking actually quite a few prior papers, uh, one in Haskell, they, they converted into schema and said, we can build something like Prolog in about 200 lines of scheme. And this was like shocking to me that you could do this, and not only do this, but it could be reasonably performant. So I, I really want to understand how this worked. Uh, the other thing was that on Oleg's site, the reason I got excited about this was on Oleg's site, he has a 300-line mini Cameron program that shows you how to do Hindley-Milner type inference, type checking, and type inhabitation in 300 lines. Right? So you're, you're like, oh, I can understand that, but if I understand this system, I want to know about that. So I, I looked up um, uh, Will's dissertation. Will's dissertation came out four years after the um, publication of The Reason Schemer. And this was the first time that <laughs> there was anything resembling documentation about what the, what the implementation, how it actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I got really excited about it because finally there was, there was some way for me to understand how the, how that's, what, what that scheme code uh, was trying to do. And it was great. It was a great read. Um, I ended up sending uh, Will and Dan a, a big thank you. Thank you for documenting this. And they ended up coming to the very first, um, or the second closure conference because I, I built an implementation of Mini Cameron for Clojure, which is called CoreLogic. Um, so it wasn't just about taking their ideas. Um, uh, they, they actually are they're always playing. They're always, they're always doing different versions of Mini Cameron. Um, but I was very curious about you know, being somebody who works on interactive applications. Can this system be made faster? Can it be made more efficient? You know, often when you're doing something interactive, you're like, can I get a better frame weight? You know, can, I, can, I, can I reduce latency in some part of my program? So I was very curious. What are, like, how far can I push this? You know, sort of taking an engineer's eye on what may seem like an academic idea. So I read this paper called The Efficient, Representation, uh, Efficient Representations for Triangular Substitutions, where they actually tried different representations. In the original program, they used a linked list, which works fine. <clears throat> but they started documenting what are the performance characteristics of other data structures. And so the substitution, I don't, I'm not going to get into it, but it's basically like a, a place to store variables and what they're bound to. And I said, this sounds, like a, this sounds like a hash map. Why don't we just stick a persistent hash map in there? How fast is that going to be? And in fact, I did that, and it was basically as fast as the fastest representation that they came up with in this paper, which is also like very much a, map, a hash map-like data structure. Um, so the other thing that happened was that if, you know, uh, uh, Spiewak, Daniel Spiewak talked about this in, in earlier, which is that there's a very much an old school style uh, FP, which is sort of characterized, which, which is fine. Scheme is great, but it's sort of characterized by scheme in that you have lots of conditional statements. And sort of the promise and the thing that people always liked about objects was that you could have this sort of polymorphism. And Al Alan Kay critiqued uh, Prolog because Prolog has a baked in, unchangeable notion of equality. Right? You can't fix unification. Unification is set once and for all for Prolog. And Alan Kay said, wow, such a great idea, Prolog, but you can't, you can't change what equality means in Prolog. This is a serious flaw in the design of that system. Um, and this is documented in this uh, paper by Cornfield, which I recommend reading, Equality for Prolog, a version of Prolog that has equality. But this is a known problem in the functional programming community, right? Um, that you really want equality to be something that can be overloaded. Object-oriented programmers and functional programmers know this. Uh, Wadler talks about it in 1988, right? how to make ad hoc polymorphism less ad hoc, right? 
that standard ML had a hack. Standard ML had a hack for the for equality, right? And then Wadler says this is this is ridiculous. We should formalize this concept, right? People are going to want to do this, and in order to make our programs more expressive, we need something like type classes. So this is the paper where they where they talk, where introduced type classes. So Clojure has had uh, had recently gotten protocols, and so sorry, had recently gotten protocols, and so I said what I want is type class EQ for logic programming. So when I when I when I took uh, core, when I built Core Logic, I said I want unification to be polymorphic and openly extendable, so that if you have some other data structure that we don't, we haven't thought of ahead of time, you can make it participate in unification, and it and it works, and it's great, and people and the people that have used it really like it. Uh, in fact, uh, Nada Emin, who is also here, who uh, did a uh, programming uh, pro, uh, tran program transformations workshop, which I think was probably totally awesome that I didn't get to see because I was working on this. Um, she actually said, oh, I want to implement this thing called nominal logic programming, which is also in Will's thesis. They had done a variant of mini camera that lets you do um, sort of these theoretical computer science stuff on the lambda calculus. But allowed, it's nice because it lets you talk about binding, uh, the binding, the meaning of binding in, in lambda terms. And so she was able to leverage the fact that we have polymorphic unification, right? That, that unification isn't baked in. We could define a new type of term called nominal, and we can say what unification means. And so integration with her work was trivial, right? It was just like, oh yeah, you, you have that, ex that extension point. It's just there. Um, and I think there are, this, is, this is, again, taking some idea and saying, well, how can we make this uh, more work in a more broad way, in a more generic way? Um, but again, taking these really fantastic ideas and maybe adding a little bit of engineering principles to them. So the other thing that I did was, uh, I, don't, I think a lot of people are, are, are sadly unaware of, of Prolog. Prolog is still fairly active in the European community, but it's more or less dead on this side of the ocean. Um, but I thoroughly recommend reading this book, Concepts, Techniques, and Models of Computer Programming. They talk about a lot of things, but the part that I was fascinated by was constraint logic programming. Um, because it takes the, the beautiful notion of Prolog and it takes it a step further, because Prolog's strategy doesn't really work for all types of problems that you might want to describe. And constraint logic programming sort of opens the door. In fact, it was in the 80s where uh, the original inventors of Prolog came up with this thing called Prolog 3, which had constraints. Um, so, and this, this, this work is still ongoing. Uh, it's also very related to Sussman and Rodul's work, um, The Art of the Propagator, which is also a fantastic paper. Um, they talk about a lot of things, but also here, they sort of describe this really incredible notion of um, constraints, right? Being able to succinctly des describe constraints, and because of that you have some sort of model that you set up, you can run the constraints, and it will produce answers in a very efficient manner. Um, so we did this. I wanted this. This is yet another thing that I was like, I, got, I have to have that. And so Claire and, and Will and Dan, they worked on, Claire Alvis, they worked on this thing called C Cameron, where they, where they taught, described how you could do this in Scheme. And once again, I read the paper, great paper, and I said, well, I want more data structures. I can see that we have the fixed point algorithm slower. Um, and I want to fix that, and, and so on. And then at the end, you know, after a bunch of work, we now have this in Core Logic. Um, and so a lot of this is not just like use this, but exposing people to the idea, to the concept, to think that this might be a way you want to solve problems. In fact, Core Logic is slower than two of the best constraint solvers that are out there that have been worked on for more than a decade. One is called uh, one is in C++ called G Code, uh, which can solve finite domain problems very quickly. I mean. 10 to probably 1,000 times faster than CoreLogic. Another one's called Jacop for the JVM, which also can solve uh, finite domain problems uh, 10 to 100 times faster than CoreLogic. And this is stuff that I ask people. If we'll have, if they'll, they'll state some problem. I'll be like, gosh, that sounds like a finite domain problem. And then you write, write, see them write a bunch of code. I'm like, well, you know there's solvers for this stuff, right? And really fast solvers. They've been worked on continuously for 10 years. Um, OK, so that's the first part. Um, now I'm going to sort of switch gears. So that was my, um, like, why I like logic programming and how I think it might be useful. Um, and this is the other part. So there, I did object-oriented programming for a very long time. And one of the coolest things about Clojure when I encountered it was that it was functional programming, but it didn't completely abandon um, the sort of, sort of object-oriented thinking. And this existed in the early days in Clojure as multi-methods. Right? And so multi-methods were a sort of like an object-oriented thing, though they were more expressive. Uh, I thought they were quite cool. Um, but the thing, uh, again, as Spiewak said earlier in his talk, um, they, they sort of live on this weird part of the performance spectrum. We have protocols, which are very fast, because they're backed by Java interfaces. And we have multi-methods, which are really expressive, but they're really slow. 
And so I was very interested in um, uh, efficient predicate dispatch, which was supposed to sort of unify uh, what people like about pattern matching, what people like about multiple dispatch, but without the sort of performance, um, the poor performance you see uh, with multi methods. And so I looked at this paper because um, it was recommended by Rich Hickey, and there I saw a little diagram which shows the decision tree, how you can build a very efficient decision tree for doing efficient predicate dispatch. And I, and I said, man, that looks like some stuff I've seen in the ML community. The ML community has been working on uh, making pattern matching faster since 1984. I think there was like, I think that might have been the first like how to how to make efficient, how to do efficient pattern matching in a functional programming language. Um, but I encountered this recent paper. This is from 2008, called "Compiling Pattern Matching to Good Decision Trees" by Luc Moranger, and it, this is about uh, OCaml. And he had this amazing graphic, which looks extremely similar, right, to the, 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 the DAG that we saw for efficient predicate dispatch. I was like, wait, there absolutely is a connection here. Right? The same strategies are being used for two different systems, one for object orientation and one for functional programming. Um, so in this paper, Luc Moranger describes um, how if you adopt a lazy pattern matching semantics, um, where here you see this is the path to one particular leaf node, one particular action that's, that's describing the pattern. And notice that there are many tests that need to be made, and there are many possible ways to the same leaf, right? the same action, the same matching line, or, if you will. Um, if you apply lazy uh, pattern matching semantics, if you, you choose the right column to test first, um, you can get a much more optimal decision tree. So here you see there's only one path to the leaf, and there's only four tests. So less tests and one path. Right, so this means less code to generate as well. So I said, that looks really amazing. I want to understand how this works. Let's implement this in Clojure, because Clojure doesn't even have pattern matching, but we have macros. Right? So we can, we can actually trivially implement the algorithm presented in the paper. So here's some OCaml code. You don't have to know OCaml if you know Erlang or ML or Haskell. This should be pretty obvious. There's a function, that, a local function that takes three parameters, which are Booleans. And then we have a set of clauses about matching over those those values. So if we naively compile this, we're going to get OCaml code that looks like this. The equivalent, equivalent match might look something like this. Notice that we have, we have three, three opportunities to match three. It appears three times, the, the third clause. Also note that we test x first. Even though on the first line, x is a wild card. It doesn't matter, right? So this is the naive decision tree. So I want to explain the decision tree process because it's actually a very neat idea and it might have apl applicability to other problems. So here's what it looks like in Core Match, which is a, the pattern matching library I implemented using um, Luke Moranger's ideas. This is the same sort of expression. So what do we do? We take the pattern matrix, right, and we and we we set it up so we have the variables at the top, we have the actions on the right on the on the on the right, and then we have the sort of matrix. Of, of, of patterns, exactly like it appeared in the source code. It's exactly the same. Um, so what we, what we notice is that we have wildcards and we have what are called constructors, these, these actual things that we want to match, right? So what Luke says is that what if we give wild, what if we score the columns? Anywhere there's a wildcard, we, we put a zero. So, so where we see a wildcard, there's a zero. Whenever we see a constructor, we give a value like one. And Anything that's beneath the constructor, so in, under Z, you notice you have, the v, you have F and T under a wildcard. Those don't get to contribute to a column score. So obviously here, from just doing this very simple analysis, we know that we have to test Y first. We can skip testing X. Um, and then what we do is we move, we move Y to the front. The Y column is now in the front. And now we can make a decision. Either Y is going to be false, or it's going to be one of the four other remaining cases. So let's move forward in the compilation process and say we say, OK, y is false. We no longer are considering y, and we are now left with just that top row, and we have x and z to consider. Well, x is a wild card. We only test z, right? And then when we are done with testing z, we only have wild cards, things we do not need to look at. We never need to look at them. Um, so with the op with, by applying his algorithm, we now have something that look, looks exactly like what I described. We, we look at y first. Um, only then do we consider x. And you see there are many cases, if we look at y and we look at z, for example, if y is false, 
then we only have to consider z and we know. So this is the optimal decision tree. There's less, less cases to consider, less tests to do. So this is done. That's actually been implemented in Clojure. The only languages that actually do this that I'm aware of is Racket and, and Clojure. Um, but we can go further. So Wadler talked about in 1987, this was 27 years ago, Wadler said the whole ML, Haskell, OCaml habit of pattern matching on concrete data types is a horrible idea. And you guys are still doing this today, right? You're, you're matching concrete types, not abstractions. And Wadler says we have to stop doing this, right? If we're going to write generic code, you have, to, you have to match on abstractions. And so I said, we already do that in Clojure. In Clojure, we don't care what the concrete type is. We have, we have types that represent the same conceptual thing. There are many implementations, for example, of things that are map-like. I never care as a Clojure programmer what type of map-like thing I have. Right? And this is really important. We, have, we, we write very reusable code. So I, so I thought to myself, how, how, much, how difficult would it be to make um, Moranje's algorithm work for hash maps? Right? And this, this actually, you could do this, but not just do it for hash maps, but optimize it for hash maps. So take here we have a hash map and say it's x. And so what, what the user is saying here is that I want to match a map that at least has the key a. I don't care what it is. On, and then it has to have b, and it has to be equal to 2. And then the second match is, well, a has to be 1 and b equals 1. Where it gets curious is the last line. The last line is a map which doesn't refer to any of the keys in the first two. right? So we put this into a matrix, like this. And then all we have to do, the, the thing is that we have to, the, the, if we're going to analyze the contents of the maps, we have to make sure that the next step that we look at, we have the same number of rows and columns. right? They have to be the same. So the only, only thing we have to do is we just assume that those are wildcard tests. right? So even though, that, even though that first pattern doesn't have a C, a D, or an E, we don't care. Those are wildcards. The algorithm says we never have to look at them Anyway, right? the only other trick then we have to play is that we, we need a new pattern type, which is this existence pattern, which, and we have to change our scoring. So now constructors, like concrete values, we score them a bit higher. Um, these existence tests score a little bit lower. And then wild cards are still 0. And then obviously we, can test, uh, we need to test B first. So Clojure has this. We optimize pattern matching on hash maps in the same way that the algorithm can, can optimize concrete types. Um, but we can go yet a step further. So this is the only thing. I was like just exploring pattern matching, and so I was like, okay, we can do Luke Baranji's algorithm. We can do um, we can do views, something like views, but we can also do extensible pattern matching. So Sam Tobin Hochstadt, who worked on the matcher for Racket, said there's no reason in a Lisp to close the language, right? So in a lot of functional programming languages that ship with pattern matching, the language is closed. You, as the user of that pattern matching system, cannot customize it to your needs. So there's no reason to do this in a Lisp. So taking a page out of the book of this book, which Alan Kay was said was the most important book on object-oriented programming in 10 years in, at Uppsala in 97, Kazales wrote another paper, which is really fascinating, called Compilation Strategies as Objects, which is a pretty crazy idea, that, that you could actually have a compilation process, and it's an object, and you can derive it. Right? You could take somebody else's compilation process derive it, extend it, and have a new one. So we did this in, in core match. right? So we have vector pattern matching in core match, so where, we, where you're allowed to match closure vectors. But the thing is that it's completely abstract. right? All that it matters is that you have, an, have, a, have a random access data type. There are other random access data types that we care about, Java arrays um, and binary data. Right? Those, they're, they're, they're random access in exactly the same way vectors are. So here I can derive using multi-methods I can divide, derive the compilation procedure, procedure for vectors and specialize them to arrays. And all I need to do is let the user give me the inlining. What statements must be inlined to make that work? So describe how we can access a random, uh, random access into an array. That's a get enclosure. Uh, how, do we, how do we count the number of elements in an array? That's count, uh, or sorry, a length enclosure. And then how can we talk about a subsection of the array? And of course, we're not going to actually do a subsection. It's just like a virtual subsection. How do we define that? And then at the very bottom, we can specialize that again for um, um, Java arrays of objects. And this will give us, um, uh, more or less, an order of magnitude uh, increase in speed over red-black trees as persistent vectors. So if you encode your red-black trees as Java arrays, you can uh, match an order of magnitude faster on them. So 
this, you can run this expression um, 10 million iterations in one second if your encoding is um, uh, as object arrays. OK, so that's, that's dispatching. That's pretty cool. Lots of interesting ideas, ideas around dispatching. And hopefully, we can use some of those stuff for, for doing predicate dispatch, which is sort of an object-oriented idea. So I want to end with the last thing, because this is a fairly new thing in the Clojure community, but it's extremely relevant um, if you're doing UI stuff, I think. And this is uh, Tony Horace communicating sequential processes, which is a really old, also a very old idea. Um, it's been recently popularized by Go, uh, a, a, an imperative language that's taking, taking hold. Um, I don't really care for it, but it doesn't matter. There, it has, has, has a CSP abstraction, and that part of the language is quite interesting and it's quite cool. Um, the, the thing is that, that people have tried this before, and they've actually been quite successful at, with it, but it's been in languages that people weren't using. Um, so uh, standard ML had um, a variant of it called concurrent ML, which had CSP in the language, and they actually built a user interface toolkit using CSP. It was called Xene, right? And so this actually now exists today uh, because Core Async, which just got released, um, works in Clojure and in Clojure Script. So we can use the, exactly the same techniques and the same research that was done in their t uh, toolkit system. So this now gives what I think a much better story uh, in a functional programming language for doing serious UI work. Um, and and the, thing, the beautiful thing about CSP is that it actually combines very cleanly with all the current excitement around uh, functional reactive programming, right? It's not like CSP and all this cool stuff that people are doing with functional reactive programming is separate. We can actually um, put them together and reap the benefits of both systems. Um, and so I've been doing JavaScript for a really long time, as, I, as I've said already. Of, uh, but this is, you can, we can actually do this in, 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 on JavaScript clients, right? So this is all asynchronous code written in a straight line way. I can run three parallel requests asking whoever, whichever request for a web result or an image or video returns the fastest. And not only can I do that, I can kill all the requests if they don't satisfy, um, they don't return the results in 80 milliseconds. No callbacks, no manual CSP. Like, sorry, CPS, no manual CPS. Getting my CSP and C CPS backwards. <laughs> um, so this is amazing like, that, I can, that you can do this right, in this system. And, and this is the type of thing that, of course, C-sharp programmers are able to do because they have async await. Scala now has something very similar to async await. Um, and this, I think, makes asynchronous programming bearable. I, I really think that most languages, it's, it's absolutely terrible to do. Um, so why, why, why would a JavaScript developer be interested in all these things? Right? What, what good is it to explore these crazy concepts? Um, so it's, it's, it's important to me because uh, I can actually run, because of ClojureScript, I work on ClojureScript, I work on the compiler, I can run all these things in JavaScript. So here I'm running um, a recent build of, of the V8 JavaScript engine. And so in 1993, Peter Norvig, when he wrote the Paradigms of Artificial Intelligence Programming, he solved the Zebra puzzle, which is a classic constraint satisfaction puzzle, and he did it in 17 seconds. This was after he built up a, a Prolog compiler and all this stuff and did all this work in like 17 seconds, and that seemed amazing because um, a naive solution to this problem, this, the zebra puzzle, you have to look at 24 billion possible solutions, right? But prologue, backtracking, and unification, you can do this in 17 seconds in 1993. So how fast can I do this in JavaScript? So I have a version of core logic that targets ClojureScript um, and running against D8, uh, V8. So you can see once V8 gets warmed up, I can do it in 16 milliseconds, right? <laughs> oh, and let me show. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. And the other thing is that, is that I think for functional programming to be taken seriously, uh, I think we have to take interactive, interactive applications seriously. Functional programming is an extremely good story on the server side for managing complexity. But it's important that, like, what if I want to make an interactive game? And it absolutely is imperative that I can do 350,000 350, iterations, and I, and I know I have to do it in 16 milliseconds. That's all the time I have to do my work. And so I spent some time taking um, Notch, who does Minecraft, and I said, can ClojureScript run his code, a version of his code, in a mostly purely functional manner and, and deliver the exact same frame rate? This is not WebGL. So this is, we're actually doing all the rasterization on, on a canvas, right? So this means we have to be able to loop around and draw pixels, and we only have 16 milliseconds to do it, right? And this is ClojureScript. Um, 
Uh, one last little demo is just kind of fun. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. So, so pattern matching. So I'm going to show how fast we can pattern match on a persistent vector versus how fast we can match on a JavaScript array using the same special, uh, specialization technique I talked about. So for one million iterations, we can, we can, we can test for balance in about one second. Uh, if, we use, if we use the array specialization, we can do it 10 million times in less than two seconds. Right? That's pretty cool. So paper to JavaScript. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, so that's really all I had to talk about. And so hopefully I've inspired you that <laughs> papers are really cool. They're really important to, to, um, uh, to read and to, to think about and to try to put into practice, because they can make our lives as programmers both more fun and more productive. So I sort of tweaked Alan Kay's classic phrase, you know, in order to predict the future, you have to invent it. I say the best way to predict the future is to read papers and engineer it. Thank you.